I'm, I am the Ed Penhout that Chris advertised before we started, so I'm here to, I'm not sure I should say anything after your introduction, Chris, but nevertheless, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab uh, at this. First of all, thank the organizers for a terrific meeting. I think the morning has really been very useful and uh, very stimulating. So it's a, it does uh, prompt a question though, Chris. I, you know, my own definition of regulatory science has been uh, in large part due to my own background, focused on uh, science that involves measurement in, a, in the classical way. But the last discussion in particular brings up the issue of should regulatory science include social science? As I know you think the answer is yes, but I think <laughs> that uh, <laughs> you would. But I think it, it traditionally has not been uh, defined as uh, that social science should be part of it. And then there was, uh, before I get into my own experience, there was a lot of discussion about various groups coming together, bottoms up, tops down, et cetera. And, you know, I learned an interesting lesson in a talk by Gary Trudeau one time. So Gary was here and gave a talk. And um, he said, you know, for years I was frustrated by the fact that many newspapers wouldn't have Doonesbury in the paper. And he said, I, I couldn't figure out why Many papers refused to carry my strip, and other papers had the strip. And his business manager said, well, Gary, just read the obituaries, and then you'll figure out when the next new newspaper will drop in place. And sure enough, as old owners of newspapers died and their kids inherited the paper, the first thing they did was bring Doonesbury to the comic page. Uh, and, I, you know, I do think there's a generational change, which is frustrating for people to wait for, but a real thing that we shouldn't uh, totally ignore in our thoughts about uh, these uh, broad issues generally. So with those couple of broad comments, I'll, uh, I'll talk about, uh, among my many lives, the three lives that had the most relevance to this discussion. Um, the first was my experience as a CEO of a biotech company, which I started in the early days of biotech, and therefore engaged me rather directly with the Food and Drug Administration. I understand Veronica's characterization of my views of the FDA is it's a perfect agency, it never does anything wrong. Uh, I think that's an overstatement of my views, although I'm not a bash FDA basher. Uh, but we had experiences of several kinds directly uh, that I still think are issues uh, within the FDA. The first was in a traditional uh, role for FDA. One of the things we were fortunate to do at Chiron was discover the virus that causes hepatitis C. And we learned that about 10% of blood transfusion recipients in this country actually in, uh, became ill with hepatitis C as a result of getting the tainted blood that had, was infected with hepatitis C uh, as a blood transfusion. So our first challenge was to make a blood test that would detect hepatitis C antibodies in patients' blood, donated blood, and therefore allow the blood supply system to um, um, essentially deliver safe blood. So hence our first major interaction with the FDA. And there, both the good and the bad of the FDA came to fore. The good part was it's fairly clear what you had to do in order to get approval for a test like this, which would be used to screen every unit of blood in the country, that you went through a very organized and rigorous process of measurement of various different aspects of this in order to gain FDA approval, including many aspects of the manufacture of the test, all of the things that are typically what FDA does well. And they, in, for the most part, still give pretty good guidance to people who want to get approval of new drugs or new uh, therapies and diagnostics uh, in terms of the process you have to go through to get approval. The disappointing part was it took an unnecessarily long period of time for the approval process to occur. For a new technology, which the FDA had not dealt with before. It wasn't a new technology, but simply a new analyte to add to the system. And uh, by comparison, our tests were approved in Japan in 90 days, and it took 11 months to get approval in the US. 
And the, we calculated that the difference between a Japanese recipient of blood and a US recipient of blood meant that in that basically nine month period of delay while the FDA was going through what it does normally, as many as 10,000 Americans actually got hepatitis C. And it was probably not necessary. So the question then was, could the FDA think more broadly about a rapid approval process for something or a, a temporary approval, some sort of way of actually facing the challenge. And it was known how many, what the level of transfusion associated, what was then known as non-A, non-B hepatitis was. Could the FDA be more responsive to a national need for a clean blood supply in a timing issue? They eventually approved the test as they of course would, but was there the possibility of actually um, accelerating the process in a way that would allow a better outcome for U.S. transfusion recipients than was the case in this case. So it, their FDA standards were important, were real, and need to be met, but could there have been a more rapid process? One of the things that I learned in this process, and I've seen it over and over again, is the need for rigor and for thoroughness in approaching regulatory uh, science issues. And unfortunately, to say in this room, academics are not very good at doing this. It's not really academic work. And one of the big challenges we had at Chiron, we started this company, uh, we being me and two professors from UCSF, and we hired all the people we knew, all of whom came from academia to the biotech world, to train academics to do regulatory science in a corporate environment is a major challenge. Because in academic research, you act, uh, the best academic researchers don't work on a hard problem very long. They figure out, okay, this problem's too hard, I'm gonna work on something else. That's how the system works. But in a process where you're in a regulatory environment and you have to go through all the steps in order to uh, so-called check all the boxes, it's almost an antithetical to the quote unquote free spirit of academic research. And this issue will come up over and over again. One of the challenges we have as a country is in many areas we don't have a workforce today to actually do this kind of work because academics are, first of all, not interested in it, but when they express an interest, they don't do it very well. So that was a, a, a major challenge in, uh, culturally that I've seen happen in many different environments. The second issue for us with the FDA was actually an issue of, I think, greater interest to you, Veronica, which is how do you actually deal with new technology at the FDA, something totally different. We were fortunate enough to invent the system which is now used to do what's called viral load testing. It actually determines how much virus is pre present in a patient sample. So if you take a, a, a blood of a patient with HIV or HCV, you can actually determine how much virus is present in the patient sample. We had a very difficult time convincing the FDA to approve a diagnostic test based on how much virus is present in a patient sample. It's hard to imagine that's true in today's world since it's almost the standard test used completely to monitor patients infected with either HIV or HCV and many other infectious diseases. But at the time, the whole concept of viral load testing was new, and therefore the FDA couldn't rely on its standard uh, operating procedures as were in place for the hepatitis C blood screening test, but had to rethink about how you actually do this. And we see this being played out over and over again. It, it, when you deal with fundamentally new concepts, how do you actually inform the FDA going forward? Well, I think the FDA has moved a long way since then, but it took several years for us to get viral load testing approved. And we had to do, uh, well, the most definitive experiment, experiment was done by a collaborator named David Ho in New York, who determined that viral load measurement was a better predictor of progression of HIV AIDS than measuring CD4 count, which was the traditional way of doing that at the time. And similarly, we sponsored studies in Japan showing the same thing for hepatitis C, that the best predictor of people's progression in the disease was how much virus they had in their blood. But since this was a whole new concept, it took a long time to develop that before you could even get a permission to, to essentially uh, 
market a uh, experimental test, if you will, uh, going forward. So I think we had two examples where the FDA works really well. Eventually they did approve the viral load testing. Um, but uh, where I, I hear, Veronica, I would agree with you, even today, I think, confronted with totally new technology, uh, where the uses are not, the thing about revolutionary technology is you don't know what it's all gonna to totally be used for in the future. So you have to take some risk in, in, in allowing some of these things to come, to come to market. So those are the lessons from my, or my ex experiences um, from Chiron. You know, I did learn another thing about regulatory science in, in that whole experiment, whole experience, which is you have to have good experiments well planned in any environment in order to get a meaningful result. And you can't cheat uh, in the re regulatory environment, especially. You, you have to design a good experiment, carry it out, and make sure that you've done so in a way where the signal to noise is uh, adequate to give you the answers that you really need. By the way, my own definition of regulatory science has been the science that's needed to inform regulatory body, regulatory agencies in the best possible way about the regulations that they will put in place uh, related to the technology. My second experience was as president of a major foundation, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. It took me into an entirely different realm. The Moore Foundation funds about $200 million a year of work trying to preserve biodiversity and ecosystems around the world. And here, it's not regulatory in the usual sense, but those investments have specified outcomes that they're trying to achieve and would like to be informed by good science about what should uh, be done in order to preserve an ecosystem, to preserve a biodiversity in a region, et cetera. And here, it's a somewhat different realm. Sometimes it is regulatory because it does lead uh, to government action on occasion. But in order to get uh, good science done in the environment world is much more difficult than it is in the medical world. In part because there isn't a good ecosystem in place and there isn't a good cadre of people to do the work. So let me give you a couple of examples. People in, this was now a decade ago, were interested in setting up areas to study that would give them a clue about what the uh, changes in climate would do to certain ecosystems. So they went about just uh, setting up ecosystems sort of randomly around the world and then measuring lots of different critters in that area. Well, when you think about it, you have to do that experiment very carefully if you want a meaningful result. First of all, the first criteria is you should put it in a place that's likely to be affected by climate change. And second of all, you better make sure it's not gonna be largely affected by other things, encroachment of urban areas or any other kinds of, of, uh, of factors that would get in the way of coming to a, a firm conclusion about your data. And then, of course, what to measure. This turns out to be extremely difficult to do. It sounds easy enough to do, but it turns out to be extremely difficult to do. And the only way to do it well is with a very rigorous approach of analysis and uh, characterization of the data. Just random collection of the data will not uh, suffice for sure. So we had people trying to do that, and uh, it was, um, you know, there, with the risk for the Moore Foundation was to waste a lot of money on this, number one, but number not to achieve the, the objectives of really learning something important about climate change and its effect on various biodiversity uh, sites around the world. So, you know, again, the work actually required in order to assess those things has to be done by a cadre of people who are willing to do data collection in a confined area over a long period of time. Rigorous work over a long period of time. We also had a big program in trying to manage, to come up with systems to manage fisheries to allow fisheries to have sustainable stocks of fish uh, to catch. And a lot of our work was done on the California coast. I won't n mention the names of the figures that we funded in academia to do that work, but I can tell you after four, five years of funding them, 
they were much more interested in discovering the n plus one new species of critter in the ocean than they were in actually keeping up the backbreaking work, if you will, of the monitoring of all the species that were there because it's 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 antithetical almost to discovery work. It has to be done again in a rigorous, well-defined fashion if you're going to have the results actually meaningful results that will convince people to make regulations. Fortunately, we were able to be a participant in getting the protected areas off the California coast, and I think the fishing regulations that have been put in place have already having a, a good result, but we had a hard time finding the right workforce. And the academics that we granted in the first place to do this generally were less interested in doing that. Well, they were very interested in getting the money, but they were less interested in doing the hard and to some degree boring work that's associated with that kind of thing. And this, this is a broad general problem in land use. So land use generally throughout the country uh, needs good science in order to, um, uh, to, to lead to good land use policies, or if you want to call them regulation, policies or regulations. And in order to get those done well, we need the right workforce and we need the right plan in place going forward. Again, uh, and here, Veronica, I like the FDA. The FDA does have a process which requires rigor and, and checking all the boxes, if you will. So uh, Chiron was working from the bottom up, uh, trying to, to get through the regulatory agencies, et cetera, and bring these new products to market. In the last seven years, I've had the, res the, res uh, the pleasure and responsibility of working from the top down, at least what appears to, on the outside as being top down. So I'm a member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology in Washington. And this, the job of this group is to advise the President, which is supposed to be the top, although one of the things I've learned in Washington so no one, there's nobody in charge, including the president. So you have to take that into account uh, doing these things. But this group has been very active over the last seven years that I've been part of it. Uh, and we've essentially advised the president on, I think now, 17 or 18 different um, proposals or areas of interest. They, we did recommend, make a number of recommendations to the FDA about the drug approval process. We had a health information technology uh, recommendation, cities of the future, the, na the National Nanotechnology Initiative, technology and aging, vaccine development, forensic science, STEM education, a broad swath of things. There are 20 of us in this group, and we sort of each head up studies based on our own uh, particular expertise. They, um, again, in the context of PCAST, the need for really good regulatory science uh, came to the fore. The first exposure I had to it was, we are required every other year to review the National Nanotechnology Initiative. And as was pointed out uh, earlier, what we've learned in doing that is there's a great concern about the toxicity and the uh, health and safety aspects of broad, widespread use of nanotechnology. Uh, and uninformed opinions all the way from Scott McNeely saying nanoparticles are going to take over the entire planet and kill everybody on it uh, to uh, uh, people who are uh, nano. Uh, proponents who say, you know, it's the answer to uh, all of the ills that face us, including health, uh, commerce, uh, et cetera, and everything in between. What we learned is there's no organized government-sponsored program to deal with the regulatory science around nanotechnology. The National Science, F there is a budget for it, the National Science Foundation funds a lot of R01 grants to people to dump nanoparticles on tissue culture plates and see what happens to them, et cetera. But th that's not how you should do regulatory science. You can get information that way, but again, they're done in academic labs with an academic interest in the subject. And if you really want to know, should I put nanotechnology particles in cosmetics? You have to do, a, you should do a very rigorous analysis which checks all the boxes. 
Or should I, in that case, I probably would be covered by the FDA, but should I put nano in paint? Should I, what should I do with nanoparticles in uh, materials that are going to be recycled or not recycled in society, et cetera? And in that case, in the nanotechnology world, the government was not organized to do this, and the industry had no guidelines from EPA or otherwise how to proceed. So it's viewed as a major barrier to actually the use of nanotechnology that we don't have uh, a system uh, to, uh, to deal with that. And then finally, I'm currently involved in a PCAST study of what to do about water supplies. Obviously, this is a result of the Flint situation. Well, water has some regulations. There's something called the lead and copper rule, which defines the amount of lead and copper you can have in water going forward. But in today's world, uh, you know, water systems also uh, occasionally are contaminated with organisms that cause Legionnaire's disease. Uh, people are getting uh, these horrible amoeba infection, infections in a couple places in the country from contaminated water supplies. So the question, for example, is how widespread should microbial testing be in water? And here you have to judge not only the water testing that should be done, but the cost uh, of doing that uh, to society. And so many of these regulatory issues at that level uh, involve both an analysis of you know, what could be done is not necessarily the same as what should be done. So the research, the regulatory science, if you will, of water uh, actually uh, demands that you make good measurements of what can be done in water and show its consequences, but then somebody else has to decide at the end of the day the cost versus uh, benefit ratio. And then finally, um, I've been having a one-person crusade to try to get people to, under, to characterize things as benefits and risks as opposed to safety and efficacy, so especially the FDA. So when the FDA approves a drug, they essentially say today it's safe and effective. There is no safe drug, and there is no totally effective drug, or very few. And it's a, dis, it's a disservice to the public to actually lead them to believe that something is safe when it's not. Uh, and it may raise the bar too high for certain kinds of medications going forward. And so among the other challenges we have, uh, with the public is actually how you define risk. Uh, and, uh, and to get this, there's a widespread misunderstanding of risk, in part because we as a species tend to think in binary terms. We make decisions, yes or no, all day long, what to do. Shall I cross the street now? You don't go through some complex calculation. The car, you do. The car is 50 yards away. I can go cross the street in, in seven seconds. And, uh, et cetera. So you, you make these things, but then at the end of the day, you come to a conclusion. I'm either going to do it or I'm not going to do it. And we tend to think that way. So risk is a hard issue. And it is one of the things that the PCAS group is actually trying to actually embed to some degree in the upcoming water report is how people should think about risk, because this affects every American. I mean, the, the, everybody drinks water. Uh, and so um, we are likely to at least have an opinion about the whole uh, risk benefit issue, but especially on the risk side. So those are perspectives I had from three different lives I've led. Uh, and at this point, um, well, first of all, thank you again to the organizers of this meeting and to all of you in the audience. It's been a terrific day so far. I'd be happy to answer a few questions before we start the next session. So if anybody has a question, please. Yes. You do. Oh, <laughs> oh you were just going to clap. OK, thank you. Well, I made a comment about the president and his, the lack of power. And so what is true is that, and our colleagues here from the federal government know this, there, there is very little tops-down authority. And National Dental Technology Initiative is a good example. There is an office of the NNI. It has almost no funding. It has a director. It has 20 different agencies who participate in the nanotechnology initiative. But none of them want a central directive. And so one of the reasons there is no regulatory science in nanotechnology is no, none of the agencies 
want somebody to define what that should be for them, and none of them have enough of a stake in this to define it for themselves. So oftentimes we make recommendations to, to the president, and we do make the recommendations directly to the president. We meet with the president probably three times a year. We discuss our recommendations. There are almost always things he's expressed an interest in. He's amazingly conversant in science for somebody who's not a scientist. Uh, and then he agrees, oh yes, we need to do this. And then two years later, nothing has happened. Uh, and, and so the, the agencies are uh, semi-independent and, uh, and oftentimes it's very difficult for the president actually, even when he wants to do something to get things done uh, within, the, uh, within government circles. So don't have too much faith in top-down <laughs> uh, forces. Yes? So I was thinking about your comments about regulatory science being misaligned with academic priorities. Um, and uh, I wonder whether your view is what the, oh, is there? Thank you. So uh, I was thinking about how you were talking about regulatory science being unattractive to academic researchers or not being aligned with those priorities. And I wonder if it's your view that the problem is that we're not training the right workforce to do that work or whether we simply don't have a funding mechanism to pay people to do that kind of work in a, in a context that's different than academia. Yeah. So um, I think it's more the latter. We don't, um, the kind of training, the kind of work that I'm talking about is largely done, should be done by technicians, not by people with PhDs. Uh, and the, that, were, that training could be well done at the community college level. Uh, and we've done a lot of recommendations about strengthening community colleges, for example. But the problem is there's no funding for that kind of workforce. And, uh, and we in academia are not training technicians anymore either, by the way. We used to have technicians in our labs on campus, in, in biomedical science anyway. But now uh, postdocs are cheaper than uh, technicians, so there are no technicians anymore. No, you, you know that problem. So, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, so you know, we have this cadre of semi-professional postdocs, but they probably aren't mentally or uh, temperamentally inclined to do the kind of sort of what a, more rote work that's associated with a, a typical uh, technician. I must say, in our nano uh, project, actually the state of California had one of the best uh, programs in terms of approving new nano materials. They actually did have a workforce to do a number of studies, but California is almost unique in that regard. But yes, we need a workforce and there's, there's nobody to, to pay for it. The NGOs of the world aren't much better than academics at doing this world. We, I learned at the Moore Foundation, unfortunately. Uh, it's, uh, they, it's hard for them to find the right, people with the right training and the right inclination to do the rigorous work of long-term uh, survey. Chris, you have a Thanks for that great, great talk. Um, I wanted to ask you to say a little bit more about the, uh, your comparison when you were working with the Moore Foundation. Yes. And you said that the, um, it was much harder to do experiments on envir um, environmental systems, on ecosystems. Yeah. Is that because, could you talk a little bit more about why that's the case? Is it because, it, uh, because of the complexity or the difficulty of setting up control plots or what, what's the, why is it harder? Oh, you've answered your own question. Uh, no, well, because they're highly related. What do you measure and where do you measure it? Those are the two questions. And uh, the smaller plot you have, the more critters you can measure. Um, but then you risk not having a representative sample, if you will, of the plot. The bigger the plot, the more difficult the, the problem of actually assessing what's there today versus what's there tomorrow and what's there five years from now, et cetera, becomes increasingly difficult. So the problem is signaled to noise. And, and so whatever you do, you have to try to optimize the signal out of the background of the noise. And you know, it's, it's, very, uh, it's really challenging uh, to do it, but it, it can be done. In cases like fisheries, where we started a lot of this work, it's been taken over by some government. There are fisheries, uh, uh, the, NOAA has a fisheries organization, so there are government organizations who've taken over some of the fisheries measurements uh, and, uh, and can do it on quite a widespread basis.
but you have to worry about both. But sighting is also an extremely important thing, uh, it, depending on what you want to measure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So some of these new technologies seem to fall outside the bounds of our normal regulatory agencies. An example would be artificial intelligence. We have people like Stephen Hawking and Bill Gates and Elon Musk saying, you know, this could be this huge risk. <clears throat> but there's no agency in the federal government that really has jurisdiction over that. So how does the federal government supposed to deal with these sort of new technologies and risks like that? <laughs> well, ask the P ask PCAS to do a study, I suppose. That could be a, a one answer, but it's not the right answer. I mean, I think it, uh, eventually people have to find out what agency in government it, it, it involves the best fit. Uh, and in the case of artificial intelligence, if the concern is the combination of intelligence and robotics that, ro that the robots will represent an environmental risk, for the population, I would guess the EPA would have to step up at some point in the future, but that's not their traditional uh, role for sure. But that's a good example of where new, new te you know, any of the new technologies, at the moment at least, nobody will step up and say that, and you made that point in your presentation. So I don't know the answer to, I still think you have to try to fit it into some existing agency rather than try to start yet another new agency to deal with things like that. So off the top of my head, if it were my choice, I would probably say to EPA, you have to build the unit uh, oh, yeah, to do yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much for your talk. Uh, you introduced two new actor groups, uh, both the distributors of the technologies through your experiences with Chiron, but also uh, the role of private foundations through your experiences with the Moore Foundation. I'm particularly interested if you have further comments on the role of private foundations as they continue to play a larger and larger role in funding of private science um, out in the, especially in the, in the United States, but, but more internationally, if you can talk more about what role they are playing and what role you could see them playing inside of these, these conversations about uh, governance. Yes. Well, first of all, personally, I'm pleased to see the growth of uh, funding of science by foundations because it does play an important role in actually a, a couple of areas. First of all, foundations are not bound by the normal constraints of what to fund, so uh, hopefully if they're well managed, they can make wise choices about funding science which don't necessarily follow the current, if you will, fads uh, in science. Um, I think the most dangerous thing I see happening, though, as a result is balkanization with inside some universities because some of these foundations are requiring intellectual property to be at least partly owned by the foundation, et cetera, and that causes some major disruption in the normal flow of, free flow of information, if you will, and, and, and science as it occurs. And, you know, that's starting to raise its ugly head. Uh, as some of these new foundations um, actually require uh, some level of ownership of the technology themselves uh, going forward. I think, you know, in the science, uh, you, you would probably not be surprised to know, in, uh, of all the philanthropy that's done in the country, science is still a very small piece. There are only four, there are half a dozen founding members of the Science Philanthropy Alliance, which is a new group that has come to be. But when we were at, when I was at the Moore Foundation a few years ago, uh, our funding of basic science, not biomedical science, but basic science, which is not biomedical, was almost half of the uh, private funding in the country. So there's still a lot of room for growth. Uh, I think, you know, in the main, uh, s some foundations are outcomes oriented, so the Moore Foundation when it funded environmental science was trying to achieve certain environmental outcomes and therefore the issue of regulatory science raises its head. But uh, Moore has a science program which funds basic science uh, uh, that's not constrained by the same uh, challenges that uh, if you're trying to achieve a societal outcome uh, would be. You know, maybe one comment about this whole discussion earlier this morning about the relationship between uh, the sort of outcomes-based science versus uh, pure science, basic science. You know, it's always amazing to me if you press a basic scientist long enough, they'll tell you, why is basic science important? Oh, because we wouldn't have discovered this useful thing if it wasn't for basic, for basic science. 
it always comes back to some payback to society for, for doing science, whether it's direct or, or indirect. And so to some degree, it's a false dichotomy. And you know, I was arguably, many people give me most of the credit for doubling the NIH budget. You might wonder, how could that be? Well, the person who actually doubled the NIH budget was, anybody know? Newt Gingrich, who was in charge in 1996, as you may remember. And a group of us went to lobby for, the, for an increase in the NIH budget, some people from NIH and other people in government, and two people from industry, me and another person. Gingrich said to the guys from the government, Please be quiet. Uh, we hear from you every day what you want. You're always here asking for something. I want to hear what this guy has to say about how the NIH support leads to a robust biotech industry. So, you know, there's, there's, it's not possible to totally separate uh, the applied from the, from the basic. Uh, and I think to some degree, society expects basic research to not deliver in the short term, but in the long term, produce societally useful results. Okay, maybe with that comment, I will close. Thank you very much for this opportunity. <laughs>